The transition of power in Detroit, who mayor-elect Mike Duggan is aligning himself with. Also, we have a new state park, plus the Obamacare PR train stops in Michigan. Stay put. My week starts right now. Michigan's turnaround is being powered by things we do better than anywhere else in the world. Today's global leaders routinely turn to Michigan to work on their most difficult problems. That's because the engineering talent in this part of the world is simply the best. So many possibilities lie ahead for Michigan's future. These opportunities are here and starting to happen. The vision for the new Michigan. Share it, talk it up, drive it home. Funding is also provided by Delta. Hi there and welcome to My Week. We are so glad that you are with us. I'm Christy McDonald. The transition of Detroit's leadership is underway. We're going to take a look at who Mayor-elect Mike Duggan picked to help him out, plus how Duggan's trying to make some friends in Lansing. Also, one business leader's candid comments about where the city is headed and what needs to happen next. And complaints about Obamacare are focused in Michigan. Kathleen Sebelius will be in town on Friday to talk all about it. It's all coming up for you tonight, so let's get started with our conversation out of Detroit tonight with our contributors. Nolan Finley, the editorial page editor of the Detroit News, and Stephen Henderson, the editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. All right, so let's get started. A lot has been happening in Detroit with the whole transition of power with Mike Duggan, and he announced leaders of his transition team this week, Ike McKinnon and Lisa Howes. That kind of threw me off a little bit, I have to, I have to admit. We you know what was interesting about that? Remember when Dave Bing came in and he had a very large transition team drawn from the business community, community people in charge of very specific functions, uh, and Mike picked two, three people and said, let's go. You know, it really does reflect the notion that um, his attitude, he feels like he knows what needs to be done and he knows how to do this job and he's not going to uh, pretend otherwise. Yeah, but why Lisa Howes and Ike McKinnon, Steve? Well, I mean, I think uh, those are two people who've been pretty close to him during the campaign. They were, uh, you know, Ike was a close advisor from the beginning. Um, uh, and Lisa Howes was the first mayoral primary loser to sort of to throw jump her on way board. behind him. Not that, uh, you know, not that it mattered that much because, you know, she, like the others, didn't get very many votes. But, I mean, I think it was... Uh, a gesture that that suggested, you know, uh, I want to be part of this, um, and so I, I guess I wasn't terribly surprised. Not he's going to announce a lot more. There are a lot more people who are going to be involved with this, and they are going to have specific areas that they're going to be in charge of and sort of focusing on. Um, but you know, it seems like it's it seems like they're pretty good picks. Uh, you know, Ike knows tons about public safety. Right. That's got to be a priority. Uh, I think Lisa's uh, uh, connection with uh, the community and in large parts of Detroit is important. It's sort of a nice sort of bookend. You see any possibility for friction between McKinnon and James Craig? Uh, maybe I think I th you know I think James Craig is a guy friction with a lot of people because uh, you know the city is out of control and, and the violence is spiraling and and oh, that I, I think I got to stop you there because that's a pretty strong statement coming if, and coming from you I mean usually you're the one that's saying this is a lawless city and for you to say I think for the first time that this city is out of control I is feel like right now uh, you know the, the, the randomness of the crime bothers me right now. Uh, the reach of crime into areas that, you know, not, not too far from my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a, 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 someone I know get carjacked at a gas station a couple weeks ago. So uh, it, that's a different dynamic than, than I think most of us who, who live in the city uh, in stable neighborhoods are used to. So, uh, and then you think of all the, 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 the very prolific killings that we've had uh, over the last couple of weeks. I think Chief Craig's got a lot to to sort of focus on and start to answer for pretty quickly. And and Duggan, I think, is going to be right on him real soon about yeah, yeah. you got to do something. Absolutely. Craig needs to be a bigger presence at this. You're starting to kill people two, three, four at a time, you know, in sure. a city. It was going along at about one a day. We could really, if this pace could continue, we could have a huge number at the end of the year. And, you know, we were talking about it last week. Uh, we had this... Uh, another triple shooting on Friday morning, yeah. and James Craig was out at the Prey Company flipping pancakes, which is a fine civic event, yeah. but I'm not sure that's where you want to see your police chief 
uh, on a day when you've got a triple murder in the city. Okay, so maybe granted, you know, he was obviously at another event, and you said you want to see more presence. Okay, so what does that look like? You know, I think he has to project a stronger image of a guy who's, you know, the sheriff in town, and yeah. he's not putting up with all of this, this, these shootings. I mean, we're we're lucky them that that it's not four and five times the number of people killed because just one day last week I looked at the crime report there were no murders but it wasn't for lack of trying seven people got shot in the city and that's a almost a daily occurrence where a half a dozen people get shot they're just a couple inches either way away from being a murder victim all right so let's get back a little bit then to transitioning and what Mike Duggan's what the next job this he's going to have to do what kind of meetings is he having then with with chief I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what conversations they've even had at, at this point. And, and he may not be there quite yet. I mean, yeah. he's got a lot of other stuff to sort of get in order. But I, but I expect that very quickly uh, they will start talking about what are you going to do and uh, uh, is it going to be sufficient? Because uh, the, the worst thing that could happen for Mike Duggan would be for him to take office uh, next January, and and next year is a is a worse year yeah. uh, for shootings and and murder. I mean th that would really uh, uh, sap some of the energy and momentum that he's got. So uh, he's going to be on top of that really really quickly. And James Craig is doing some good structural things in terms of uh, yeah. of fixing this department and. You know, he's he's sort of taking this long-term approach, to fit, and and you need to do that, but you also need to really quickly get ahead of this murder and violence wave, or people aren't going to stick around for a five-year plan to kick in. Yeah, people who are living in the neighborhood saying it's They're not fast leave. enough, no matter how long-term plan that you're looking at. All right, so Mike Duggan also met with people from Lansing this week. What does he say to them, and, and, and how does Lansing kind of take Mike Duggan? He says, trick or treat. <laughs> Holds his little bag out. And says, uh, can I have some money? I think Lansing has made it pretty clear, though, that come to us well, for something else me. besides oh, money right. because we're not going to give you any money. So is this the beginning of a, a kind of interesting relationship here? Well, I think it's a, it, it, it's about line drawing, right? Uh, what is it that that uh, that he's going to do and what is it that they're going to do? Uh, and I don't I don't I don't think it's a bad thing that that may be a little adversarial. I mean, I think uh, the the weakness in the mayor's office um, uh, during the first four or five, whatever it's been, five months of, of Kevin Orr's tenure is part of the problem, that, that you do need somebody there to assert uh, a different point of view, a point of view from the city. Kevin Orr is not from Detroit and uh, doesn't understand a lot of the dynamics that go on here. You need somebody there saying, here's what, here's what this actually looks like, here's what this would mean, let's do it this way. Um, you know, running city government is is very difficult and not something that Kevin Orr has any experience with. Uh, you know, it's not going to be a bad thing to have somebody in there who's who's sort of raising their hand, standing up and saying, "Give me some of this stuff to to actually handle," and and also somebody who's going to be able to deliver on that uh, in a way that that Dave Bing never seemed to be able to. And he needs some help. I mean, I I'm, I can't. Uh, I got to imagine he's asking for a stronger state police presence, for example, in the city. You know, maybe we don't need to write speeding tickets in Alpena for a while, but we got people getting slaughtered in Detroit. So maybe we double up the state police presence until we can get more cops on the street here, more people through the academy, more cars, and et cetera. Um, he needs, you know, both money from Lansing, but he, you know, there are also non-monetary things they can do, and he needs all the help he can get. I mean, you think about some of the money needs that this city had. I mean, we haven't really started talking right. about that, uh, but you know, even after the bankruptcy, there is going to be a need for a cash infusion uh, to do some really important things. Public safety being being you know a yeah, number, one. number one. Uh, you have police officers who make less than the statewide average. Uh, way less, uh, and and now you're going to talk about taking their pensions, and the pension was one of the things that set them apart. It sort of said this is a job worth doing because you get a payoff in the end. So now you're going to have almost no incentive to do one of the worst jobs, one of the most dangerous jobs uh, in America. You have got to find money, I think, to plow into either salaries or some sort of retirement uh, to make that a job that people want to do and do well because you're never going to stop well, the murders. How much money did the federal government pour into New Orleans after? Oh, it was a half billion dollars. And I would say you could have ridden around New Orleans after Katrina and it wouldn't looked 
much different no, than what that's Detroit right. looks like now. I mean, if you just focused on blight and you, if you tore homes down efficiently instead of inefficiently, so if you make the leap and say, oh, the city's going to start doing it efficiently, it's still a $500 million project yeah. to tear down all those homes. That's Where's right. that money going to come from? Somebody's got to help us out. I mean, only... Washington's the only place you're going to find that money. And that's only one step of the pro pro you know, just program, too. Once you, once you clear the area, then you've got then this huge loss of land. Then you've got yeah. to have the plan then for why? it. All right, let me talk about money real quick. Um, bankruptcy and art at the DIA, what was in uh, what was in the Detroit News today, and the, yeah. the meetings that are going on. An interesting, interesting situation here. Yeah, Dan Howes, Robert Schnell, Chad Libingood had a pretty good story today uh, uh, in the Detroit News. G we knew Jerry Rosen had met with foundations last week, Jerry Rosen being the he uh, head judge of the of the federal court there. And what he asked them to do was, you know, come up with, be creative, come up with a plan uh, to help the city out of this situation and protect the art at the same time. So what he's asking them to do is put up the money that you might expect to get out of the art, probably a half of half a billion dollars, uh, 500 million over a period of time. Uh, put that money up, apply it to mitigating the, the loss of pensions for retirees and you know solve a very sticky problem that if we don't solve, what, what Rosen's worry about is that it, this is going to be tied up in lawsuits for years and the city will never get out of bankruptcy. So, aha, is that the solution, but that's also $500 million is a staggering amount of money coming those, from those foundations. Well, and that's what, that's what Kevin Orr had been asking from the museum, yeah. uh, uh, which, you know, it's an eye-popping number. Of course, if you, if you assume that the collection is worth what people think it's worth, uh, you, you could probably have gotten to that number by selling pieces, but then, of course, that ruins the museum. It, it destroys, you know, one of our best cultural, uh, really the only uh, cultural jewel that you can. Uh, well, it certainly that sets way. up a lawsuit that, and that's what he's they would sue. To they would sue, and they would have to to protect the, mm -hmm. the museum. There, you know, the board there would not be. They would be negligent not to just roll over and do that. Um, and so, this is uh, a, a smart way to sort of insert a third party who you know, who's got deep pockets and an interest in Detroit and say, maybe you can be the bridge here to get this done without destroying the museum, without uh, killing uh, the, the pensions uh, the way that, that, that we thought. I think it's a, I think it's a very bold move uh, by a judge who, who is all about bold moves. I mean, this is very, yeah. th this has Jerry Rosen written all over yeah. it, right? Uh, he and the best option, do you of think, of, well, of everything that have been talked about? It could be, idea. and you know, what, when Rosen called these foundations in, what he heard from them is that there's a tremendous amount of pent-up desire nationally to help Detroit. There's a lot of national foundation money out there that could go to Detroit because, you know, we've captured the attention of the nation and people do want to help, but they don't want to give that money directly to the city. They're worried it's get um, frittered away, and it would. And so this is a way to bring that national money in. Now, the question is, you can, have, you know, by extension is, what would it have gone to yeah. if not to this? Would it have gone to blight removal? To places. Would it have it's gone to education? Some, it's going to have to come know, from someplace. That so. money, yeah, it's not new. It's not extra money. It's money that might have came in to do something else. All right. Well, you know, across the state, we are watching Detroit's attempted recovery and change, and what happens next in the state's <laughs> biggest city, of course, affects all of us. And business leaders who have invested in the city are watching as well. We had a chance recently to sit down with Sandra Pierce, the vice chairman of First Merit and CEO of First Merit Michigan, who also served as chair of Detroit's financial education advisory board. We're right now in court uh, where a judge is trying to figure out whether this city is broke or not. You've looked at the books. Is this city broke? I would say that uh, anyone that really spent time looking at the numbers, looking at not only the debt, not only the 18 billion, you can argue what is, you know, what is or isn't allowable mm -hmm. under the bankruptcy code. Look at the P&L and look at the revenues that this city generates, which has been de in decline for many years, as all of us know, and what we're spending. And the number is negative. So that means we do not have enough cash flow to service the city residents and to turn on the lights and, and pl snow plow and you know just s basic city services that we need to live. So we are in financial distress, we are bankrupt. It will be, I'm convinced, proven in the court system and then the right things will happen. We have to get the balance sheet corrected. That's what bankruptcy will do. 
but we also have to get the operations of the city working so that anyone that lives and works in the city gets the services that they expect and they deserve. So that's a different, that's a different set of work streams, right? Sure. I mean, we've got 44 city departments in Detroit. All 44 need investment. Yeah. All 44 need additional talent. All 44 need money. Uh, uh, what's your impression of how the relationship between uh, the city administration led by the mayor and the emergency management uh, led by Kevin Orr will be once we get past uh, Mayor Bing being mayor? I know that's not worked out the way anybody anticipated. I think the financial advisory board thought perhaps there would be more of a partnership. Uh, are you uh, optimistic about that improving after the election? Here's what I would expect. What I would expect with current administration and future administration, every single person working in the city, whether you're the emergency manager or you're the mayor or you're a city employee, we need everyone's help to get what we need to get done, done. So as far as I'm concerned, there's enough to do so that I'm very hopeful that everyone gets engaged. And it's up to Kevin because of the powers under the the act he's working under to decide that and decide what to give each person and administration. I talk to him a lot about, as does all the members of FAB, every, we, uh, there's enough for all of us to do. So, so I'm very optimistic. Do not leave anybody on the sideline now or in the future. Do you think it's, it's going to be a very interesting proposition though because you also have egos involved and you have high level people who are maybe not used to working together and maybe that's the buck stops with them but now they find themselves in a position where they have to work with two high level people. So I say we have to get over ourselves as leaders in, uh, for taking on a position in the city of Detroit that is in the condition that it's in because of so many years of distress uh, if, if we have an ego getting in the way, we don't belong in the job. Sandy, you've looked at not just the books, you've looked at the processes, the, the, how the departments run. Um, talk to us about the culture of city government and what needs to change there. From a, listen, there, let me say this, there are a lot of skilled people that have the competency to, to do the job. We need the right managers in every department to kind of row the boat in the same direction instead of worrying about just their department. It's not cohesive enough. It's, they don't, you know, it, to their, um, I, I, have to, I have to say to, to all of them working in the city that stuck through what we've been through, they deserve the chance to be a part of moving this city forward. And so they need technology, they need management, they need a defined process, they need metrics from, from which to be measured by, and they need everybody aligned on what is the agenda to take us to the next level. And, and we just, it's just a matter of getting it together and making it happen and providing the resources necessary to get it done. And frankly, resources is the issue, right? I mean. The, the there's not a system in the city that doesn't need assistance, doesn't need help. Is the position that Detroit is in right now, do you believe detrimental to other businesses in the state of Michigan? Listen, I view what the city is going through now and having the courage to take this action of going into bankruptcy is, is looked on by the business community as favorable. It is about time that we're addressing the financial issues in the city. And so I don't think it's harmful. I actually think it is an event that is bringing us together. Because right. we know once the balance sheet gets fixed, that's a good thing. We have to work on, okay, now let's go into the neighborhoods. Now let's go into the yeah. fire department. Now let's go to the police department. Let's fix, let's fix the payroll system. So there's a lot to do beyond fixing the balance sheet. And this is a very good first step. Our thanks to Sandra Pierce. Well, the deer deal is done. Belle Isle will officially become the 102nd state park in Michigan. The state lease saves the city millions of dollars a year, but now it's time to see exactly what and how the state will invest in the site. They are already in the middle of that 90 day assessment. So let me ask you, I'll start with you, Steve. What does the state have to prove here? Do they have to prove anything? 
Well, I mean, they got to prove they can manage the island better, but th that's a pretty low bar, isn't it? <laughs> uh, you know, I live really close to the island. I spent a lot of time out there. It's a mess. Uh, you know, you've got uh, bathrooms that don't work. You have flooding all over the place. Uh, and, and that's not to say anything about the lack of programming. Uh, you know, Belle Isle should be full of kids every day in the summer out there doing things that, that, that uh, like it was when I was a kid. We don't have money to, to, to even run those programs anymore. And so I think the state, if they wanted, could really make that into uh, a destination for people all over Michigan uh, to take their kids, to take their families and, and, and have a good time. Uh, but but I, I think, again, the bar here is low. I mean, if you just take care of it, uh, you're doing better. You're already, we've been, uh, they gotta you've do, already gone they ahead. They've got to do more than that. I mean, you, they took this over. This, is a, this was a big move, a big play. If it's a year from now, as messed up as it is now, people aren't seeing yeah. progress. They're not seeing buildings getting fixed. They're not seeing uh, fun things happening on that island. They're not seeing the stinking geese cleared out and all that mess. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you get no, rid of the no geese. You, people, you turn people loose with shotguns and say, have at them, wow. boys. But, um, so now yeah, you can't do that, by Island. the way. <laughs> um, you sure can. But anyway, if people a year from now look at Bell Island and say, well, I don't see the difference, uh, that's going to come back to bite the governor in the butt. He's got to do... He's got to do big things there. All right, and we'll be watching and waiting to see. Well, you know, just under 27,000 people were able to sign up for Obamacare all last month on healthcare.gov, which shows the administration has a big problem. Another 79,000 signed up with state exchanges, but Michigan doesn't have one. We're in the federal system. And as the government scrambles to fix the website, they're sending Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, who has been in the line of fire over Obamacare, over the rollout, to Michigan tomorrow. Okay, Nolan, so what does Kathleen Sebelius say tomorrow? I, what can she say here I in quit. Michigan? <laughs> I quit, and I think people would be, it's the only thing that's going to make people happy. All right, she's not going to say that. No, but look, this, what, this thing is a, it's just an absolute mess. You have even Democrats now lining up outside the White House saying, man, something's got to happen or we're going to get slaughtered next year's elections. Bill Clinton saying, man, you got to keep your promise. You made a promise to American people. You can't now spin. you got to keep your promise. Problem is, you can't keep that promise because it's too far down the road. Two and a half years, insurance companies have been working frantically and spending billions of dollars to rework insurance systems. You, you know, Republicans say repeal. You can't repeal it now. You would throw the whole system in the chaos. The whole system would collapse. But Christy, this is the biggest attack on the middle class we've ever seen in America because now you're going to have families who are just barely getting by, trying to save for college, trying to pay their mortgage, and they're going to have medical bills in, in a lot of cases, an extra 10 grand a year. Um, because of, of, of the way employers are having to change policies. Only the poor and the rich will be able to afford to have babies. Can you imagine a young couple um, coming home from the hospital with a baby and a $10,000 bill? Well, I mean, I think it's going it, to, this is going to have to play out now over the next couple, uh, next couple of months. But let me ask you this, Steve, why Michigan? Why are they coming to Michigan now? Well, I mean, I, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I would have sent her here, uh, given given the problems that we've had. And let's be clear about what some of the problems that we have in Michigan are about. We have a legislature that waited uh, a long time to even uh, pass the exchange and the, the, the Medicaid expansion, and that's why we don't have a website uh, in Michigan right now. So you have to go on healthcare.gov. That's one of the big problems is that uh, you have these states where you would have lots and lots of people participating. Texas is a great example. Texas has something like uh, uh, four million uninsured uh, uh, people who would who would qualify to get on on Medicaid. So what what message are they? They won't do hang it. On, they hang won't on, hang on. What it. what message are they hoping to send by coming to Michigan though? By sending I think, Kathleen I here. I think this is. I think I think the strategy here is a disaster. I mean, this is not a PR problem. It is a is a functionality problem, and it's a political problem for the president, right? I mean, you've got to make this system work, especially in the early, early going, because all of the benefits of this, uh, this reform come down the road, 5, 10, 15 years down the road, when, when, the, when the fact that you have pe fewer people without insurance lowers the costs for everybody. That was, the, that was the theory behind the whole thing. And if you can't get it up 
and running early. You can't get a line to figure out what even yeah. you're looking at. That's your early problem. Promises, have a big problem. If your per early promises aren't working, your long-term promises aren't going to, well, to either. The problem is not Medicare that Part people D can't sign problem. on to exchanges. The problem, the problem is that is that the great swath of America who were told this is not going to impact your insurance, you're going to be okay when this is done, are now seeing, seeing insurance um, changes, insurance policies coming through the mail that they're not going to be able to afford. This was supposed to make America healthier. How on earth is it's going to make America healthier if well, you can't afford, because of your co-pays and deductibles, to go to the doctors well, for okay, the test? But and those are right. those last are great, 30 seconds, those Stephen, are great you get the last word. Points. Here's, here are the plans that are being eliminated. The, the plans that are being eliminated didn't cover the things that were driving costs up in the system. And so getting rid of them and, and forcing people to get on plans that actually cover things and cost more, I mean, the idea is you've got to pay for this stuff and, and pay for it up front instead of in the emergency rooms. And in the long run, it will lower costs. How many and, families and, are going to be able to afford 10 grand a year? And they have to, and they have to get that website up, up and running so people can even they see what... Do the information. All right, guys, thanks so much. Thank Before you. we end tonight, just a quick invitation to let your voice be heard when it comes to the direction that Michigan is headed. We're teaming up with the Center for Michigan for a community conversation next Wednesday, November 20th. I'll be moderating the discussion in Detroit. Tell us what you think about the state's economy, education, and future. Just go to myweek.org to find out all of the details. And that is going to do it for my week. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, at myweek. For all of us at Detroit Public TV, for Nolan, for Stephen, I'm Christy McDonald. We'll see you next Next week. Business Leaders for Michigan is dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and economic growth. Learn more at businessleadersformichigan.com. Funding is also provided by Delta.